Amen. many uh, protests, signs holding up, and watching that actually reminded me of two years ago when I visited my parents in Taiwan, uh, met with them, and you see my parents sitting in that big group far away in the hot sun, and they were sitting there for this event, for the Thai Human Justice case, um, hope, hoping to see justice, and so they were there. And what really t got to me was when my dad approached someone um, to let them know what we were doing. He said, you and I are about the same age. Taxation reform, if it gets better, it's not going to affect me, but it's going to affect our children. <laughs> I'm the, the biggest daddy's girl, and I just felt like, you know, I grew into it not understanding what the Taiwan case was all about, but I was, you know, we were performing for the Taiwan's birthday celebration every year, not knowing much about it, and then growing up now to see that my dad or the people before us have fought so hard to make sure that the truth is known, that justice is given to the Taijiman. So I'm actually very glad to have met so many good friends along the way. Professor Jacobson, so good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, and you know, coming together and hearing every time that you speak or any of the experts from around the world about the casino, all of your support has been has meant a lot for us to be able to continue to find different ways to continue to make sure that we can find justice for all people and not just Taishman. And on the, um, on the same note of this great platform, I was downstairs. I don't know if you all had a chance to visit the exhibit hall. 
there is a big poster for the um, charter, the Charter of Religious Freedom, and I was reading one of it, which says, whereas the denial of religious freedom to any person is to deny his or her right to live a fully human life and to forge as a human being. Mm. So the summit declares that every government, every religious community, and every political and civil society organization in the world should strive toward the goal of achieving freedom of religion and conscience for everyone, everywhere, protected in the law and valued by culture. And I specifically pick that um, the fact that it mentioned the word conscience, because a lot of these issues can be resolved by a single act the voice in your conscience to do the right thing because oh, you see oh, from a lot of these cases maybe a moment of grief got us there but willing to say hey i made a mistake and i'm willing to correct it takes a lot of guts and a lot of hearing and listening to their conscience for that to happen so we're all here today every single one of you we are all a part of this um, taking a step forward towards the goal of achieving freedom and religion and conscience for everyone, anywhere. So a big round of applause to you all. Thank you. <laughs> and so as mentioned a little bit earlier, this meeting today is brought to you by the Action Alliance for Address 1219. Uh, they are a group of international and also Taiwanese legal, religious, and human rights specialists working to restore the truth about the ongoing persecution of Taiwan in Taiwan, a 24-year persecution caused by a small group of bureaucrats and their misuse of authority and violation of the law. And the religious freedom and human rights of Taiwan have been seriously violated because the legacy of authoritarianism remains in Taiwan. So the Taijiman Qigong Academy is an organization of Qigong martial arts and self-cultivation. It is an international nonprofit organization that aims to foster Taijiman culture and improve the physical, and mental, and spiritual health of all global citizens. And it has self funded trips to over 101 nations and to promote the ideas of love, conscience, and peace around the world. So, we'd now like to share with you a short video that introduces Taijiman and its endeavors and pastors around the world. Of the country 
We see in the video um, when Dr. Hong and Tai Chi were in Hawaii that year, and it was actually just a few days after 9 11. Uh, Dr. Hong had promised that he would go to Hawaii, but 9 11 happened. And it was hard to get tickets. Everyone was saying, Dr. Hong, don't go. It's very dangerous. Right now, everyone's very frantic. And Dr. Hong, our school said, we have to go. I made a promise, and I will bring the love and peace that we wish to share with everyone there to Hawaii to make sure that everyone feels the peace and that we are in this together. And so hence, the, so we got the picture and the honorary the recognition in Hawaii. So that's the strangest story just to share with you um, what Taijuman is about. Uh, Dr. Hong teaches his Dietze, um brothers and sisters, to be happy, healthy, but also uh, to cultivate the heart and help others. And so he has spent many hours, uh, many days in the past 24, almost 25 years now for this case because we believe that it is not only for ourselves, but also Taiwan and perhaps of all the people around the world. And so um, after 1987, when the martial law ended in Taiwan, there was a transitional period in which the government had targeted certain spiritual groups. And uh, this is where it kind of happened when in 1996, the first direct presidential election took place in Taiwan and the government went after religious and spiritual movements that did not show support for the president during the election. And even though Taijuan did not take political sides, it was caught in the crossfire. And next we have a movie directed by Dr. Massimo Entrovigne on the case. Please enjoy. A question of justice the Taijuan tax case in Taiwan. Taiwan is known as a beacon of democracy a region plagued by dictators. Yet, in 2020, thousands took to the streets to protest serious violations of human rights on the island. They were members of Taijima, a Taiwanese spiritual movement based on esoteric Taoism. It promotes a holistic development of the mind and body, rooted in the practice of Qigong, including teachings about martial arts and other traditional techniques. Thousands of Tai Chi Lin members regularly bring culture to the world through events that have been praised by political authorities, both internationally and in Taiwan. Tai Chi Lin Qigong Academy was founded in 1966 by Dr. Hong Daozhan, who is also well known throughout the world for his promotion of world peace and dialogue between religions and cultures. I, I can see Tai Chi Lin having a very, very positive effect for, for Taiwanese society. Dr. Hong's path as a spiritual teacher has not been easy. Religious liberty is something Taiwan has achieved through a wealthy road only. In 1996, largely for political reasons, the government cracked down on religious and spiritual movements accused of supporting opposition political parties. The campaign also targeted Tai Chi Men, although it had not taken political sides. On December 19, 1996, Tai Chi Men facilities were raided and Hong was arrested. He 
He and his wife's assets, including private holdings not connected with Taiji, were frozen. These actions were carried out upon orders of Taipei court prosecutor Ho Guan Men, who developed a personal vendetta against Hulk and Taiji Men, and was later recognized by Taiwan's control unit, the body entrusted with checking illegal activities by public officials. Prosecutor Ho promoted a self-help association of so-called victims of Taiji Men, which was found by the Taipei District Court to be a false organization, whose leaders had created bogus claims. The court also found that there were no victims. On April 15, 1997, Prosecutor Ho indicted Hong, who was freed on bail on May 26. His wife and three Taiji Men members were operating a fraudulent cult. Ho even accused Hong of raising problems, something which is totally foreign to Taiji Men's practices. From his public statements, it looked like Prosecutor Ho was the one who really believed in problems. Between April and June 1997, Prosecutor Ho wrote to state and local administrations ordering the dissolution of Taiji Men, and even that water and electricity supplies to Taiji Men facilities in Taipei be cut. The Ministry of the Interior and local governments later annulled these orders and declared them illegal, as no decision had yet been rendered against Hong. In fact, Prosecutor Ho's case eventually collapsed. On September 25, 2003, Dr. Hall and his co-defendants were acquitted of all charges by the Taipei District Court. On December 13, 2005, a high court decided to confirm an appeal to the first degree verdict favorable to Taiji. On July 13, 2007, the Criminal Division of the Supreme Court of Taiwan pronounced a final appeal to Taiji and defendants, declaring them innocent of all charges. Compensation for the wrongful detention was given to Hong and his co-defendants. However, a byproduct of Prosecutor Ho's ill fate actions remained. Instigated by Prosecutor Ho, the National Tax Bureau accused Hong of tax evasion and issued tax bills for the years 1991 through 1996. What was the basis of these claims? As it happens in most spiritual movements, members of Taiji Men, who are called Jisa, offer money as a gift to Hong, whom they recognize as their Shifu or master. These gifts are included in so called red envelopes. The National Tax Bureau claimed that the content of the red envelopes should not be considered as a gift, but as a tuition fee members pay for receiving training in a so called prayer school meaning a school where students engage in intensive study of the subject for a short period of time. Gifts are not taxable, while cram school's tuition fees are. In Taiwan, there are many Qi-only martial arts organizations, and none has ever been taxed for gifts given to their masters. The Ministry of Education in Taiwan, which has direct regulatory authority over cram schools, declared three times from 1997 through 2000 that Taiji Min is not a cram school. Taiji Min is indeed not a cram school. In 1999 and 2000, both Taiwan's finance minister and deputy finance minister publicly stated that since the Taiji Min tax prosecution derived from a criminal case, if all of his co-defendants will be acquitted in the criminal court, then the tax claims will be withdrawn as well. However, this did not happen. All of his co-defendants were acquitted of all criminal charges. Yet the National Tax Bureau continued to claim that the money in the red envelopes was a disguised grand school tuition fee and maintained the tax bills. Note that the 2007 Supreme Court decision that acquitted all of his co-defendants from all criminal charges explicitly stated that they were not guilty of tax evasion. In 2002, following instructions by the Ministry of Finance, the National Tax Bureau conducted a random survey among Tai Chi Men Dizu to determine whether they regarded their contributions as gifts or tuition fees. All the 206 Dizu who responded indicated that they considered their contributions as gifts. However, the Tax Bureau declared that only nine respondents had clearly indicated that their contributions were gifts. The statement was false, but the Tax Bureau refused to release the answers to the survey. Based on the Bureau's false statement about the survey, the Ministry of Finances refused to rectify the tax bills against all and Taijima. 
they appealed to administrative courts, and in Taiwan, the Supreme Administrative Court ruled in favor of Tai Chi Men on August 6, 2009. On July 17, 2010, the manipulation of the survey was exposed at a public hearing in the legislative event, i.e., Taiwan's parliament. Later, the National Tax Bureau agreed that a new open survey should be carried out. This happened only in 2011, and results were disclosed in 2012, revealing that there had been 7,401 respondents, and all had answered that they regarded the content of the red envelopes as gifts. The National Tax Bureau had promised to be guided by the results of the survey, yet they reacted by proposing to consider 50% of the money received in the red envelopes as gifts and 50% as tuition fees. This was obviously not consistent with the other results of the survey. Tai Chi Men thus started another long journey through Taiwanese courts, supported by legislators and other public authorities, and by human rights organizations throughout the world. From this long and painful struggle, they emerged victorious. In 2018, the Supreme Administrative Court ruled that the content of the red envelopes should be treated as gifts rather than as tuition fees. The basis of the 20-year persecution of Tai Chi Men by the National Tax Bureau had finally been removed. Unfortunately, this was not the end of Tai Chi Men's tribulations. The National Tax Bureau had initially alleged tax evasion for six years, from 1991 to 1996, after the 2018 decision by the Supreme Administrative Court. It agreed to reduce the tax bills for the years 1991, 1993, 1994, 1995, and 1996 to zero. But based on the claim that for 1992, a decision had been rendered by the Supreme Administrative Court in 2006 and was final, it maintained the tax bill for 1992, including interest. Both the decent and the public opinion in Taiwan understood that this was a political vendetta after Tai Chi Men had publicly proved the National Tax Bureau law. Clearly what happened in 1992 was not different from what happened in the other years, and justice would have mandated to deal with it in the same way. Adequately wrong decisions can always be revised if justice has to be served. The tax authorities treated Tai Chi Men as a credit school and taxed it accordingly. Since the finding of fact was incorrect, the application of law was wrong as well. Therefore, the incorrect court order should not be executed. For example, when you clearly know that a person is wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death, you should not execute the person. You should try to correct the mistake and uphold justice. If the person is killed as per the sentence, then he is unjustly killed by the government. Now that the tax authorities have admitted their mistakes, and the criminal court has ordered state compensation, it is unjust for the government to auction the assets of Tai Chi Men's leader. If it does, that is theft of his property. No appeal by Taiwanese or international politicians, scholars, or human rights organizations stop this vendetta. Not even the courts of law On May 5th, in July 23rd, 2020, Taipei High Administrative Court wrote twice to the National Tax Bureau of the Central Area asking them to treat 1992 as the other years were treated. All of this was to no avail. In August 2020, properties belonging to Hong were seized at auction, then confiscated after the auction was not successful, despite massive peaceful street protests in Taiwan and appeals by international NGOs. As we see from the video, it has been a very long process, um, a lot of detail in between, and many of our experts and scholars have spent a lot of time trying to look into this matter and seeing what went wrong and how we can come out of this. And now it's a great honor to have Professor Kenneth Jacobson with us today. Uh, we'd like to invite him to share his speech today on this matter. So let's welcome Professor Kenneth Jacobson. Thank you so much. It's hard to
to sit through this video as someone who believes in the rule of law and not be offended by what I see. I teach my students and I lecture around the world about how important the rule of law is. And there is no and was no application of the rule of law in the Taiji tax case. Taiwan is an island of democracy, a beacon of democracy in an area that has absolute turmoil, political turmoil, as well as oppression in that region. That beacon faded with the Taijinan tax case. I love Taiwan. I love the country of Taiwan. I love the people of Taiwan. But what has happened here has emerged from the conduct of some rogue bureaucrats and government officials that has now been tolerated by the government itself. And that is shameful. There are people, there are institutions, there are organizations that have the ability and had the ability to put a stop to this. And the, they did not. You have a very, very unusual, but I think good system of separation of powers in Taiwan. In the United States, we have legislative, judicial, and the executive. You have another one, the Control UN. And the Control UN, as did any other, every other organization that looked at this problem, found that what was done by the prosecutor was inappropriate, and yet nothing happened. And the ultimate irony is that the control UN has a department of, of all things human rights that investigates human rights. The control UN is charged with the responsibility for investigating rogue government officials. It did. It found violations and nothing happened. I call upon the president of Taiwan. I call upon the leaders of Taiwan to fix the mistakes of the past. As I have said before, to allow errors to continue, to perpetuate mistakes that were made in the past, is as bad, if not worse, than committing those mistakes in the first place. This is a travesty, travesty. it is a tragedy too. It is unjust. And as someone who respects and has lived his life and career respecting the law, rule of law, this is offensive and it should hang and it should hang now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for driving here a long way. I know you drove from Philadelphia to be here at the summit. Um, as Professor said, he is the practice professor. I'm sorry, I didn't mention this earlier. Um, Professor Kenneth Jacobson is the practice professor of law from the Temple University School of Law in Philadelphia. Um, thank you for always been here. I remember a couple of years back, you spent many days trying to figure out the system and understand what, what's behind all this. So um, the time and the effort that you have put into this, I would say on behalf of all of us, we say thank you. Thank you. Um, always an honor to have you here. <laughs> Keep repeating that. It's just happy to see you um, to have your support for sure. Uh, and next, we actually like to share with you all of you a video from Dr. Massimo um, Anchovini, who wanted to be here, but because of COVID um, travel regulations, he could not, but he did send in a video. So let's take a look. I would like very much like to participate uh, in the international religious freedom. Uh, some people for different reasons. Uh, the first reason is it continues the extraordinary work done by Ambassador Braumark for several years on behalf of uh, religious liberty. The second reason is uh, this side event uh, is about Taiwan, uh, a country 
cases like this and he brought to our attention that um, and elaborated that the abuse of tax system to persecute um, religious and spiritual groups has become obviously a global problem as through the summit we know as well um, that many government officials around the world use tax as a means to persecute religious belief groups that they perhaps don't like in a report recently submitted uh, by the French NGO to the UN Human Rights Council states that French government um, officials had also used tax means to persecute freedom of belief. And this report, report also mentions that a small number of Taiwanese officials have persecuted Taishman by tax means. International forces can stop a small number of Taiwanese officials from persecuting freedom of belief by taxation, which is of great significance to protection of human rights in the world. Um, and I think for me, it still serves as a reminder that having a system 
doesn't make it okay. Uh, we all have to do our part, whether the government officials or all the individuals, um, to make that system work because the system is by the people for the people. Um, so we always have to stick together to make sure that we are on that right balance that everyone lives um, and flourishes, like stated in the charter, that we can all um, live that life that we deserve as human beings. So thank you once again from Dr. Simo for sending that message. And you know, as mentioned before, we are grateful for these different organizations for coming together in support for our efforts and also for their efforts. Um, one of these is Association of World Citizens, um, Dr. Renee Wadlow. Uh, couldn't be here today, obviously, but uh, he's overseas because of COVID. Um, but he did send his regards to everyone. And if you'd like to learn more about the Association of World Citizens, we do have his contact and he has regular messages about um, human rights issues that he sends out. So please be sure to approach me if you would like to have that contact. And so for this, um, as I mentioned today, it's very special because it marks the 14th anniversary of when the Supreme Court ruled Tai Juman not guilty. So after the initial incident in 2007, Tai Juman was not ruled not guilty on July 13th. It's been 14 years since that ruling, and here we are still having to speak about how can we resolve this? 14 years is enough to raise a teenager. It's so much of our time already, but we are here once again. And next we have a video to share with you of what has happened in 24 years, not just the um, illegal acts, but where has this time gone and what has happened to with the 24 years that belonged to Dr. Hong and the entire Taijiman. Here's the video. It's grown like this. Now we have no way to save this place anymore. And how would she feel if he sees this? He has put his heart and soul into this place. How oh, can we store our 25 boys and years? How oh, can we store this place for us? that was actually forcibly auctioned last year uh, due to the unjustified tax bills that the Financial Bureau and the taxation authorities refused to um, refuse to take back. And so the land that could have been was uh, confiscated last year. 
So for many of the Taijiman Jitsu, it is very unfortunate that it is happening um, to an organization that has been widely praised, not just by a small group of people, but people around the world. And I personally, I feel it. Um, I grew up as a shy girl. Uh, to be able to speak here was something that is unimaginable to me. But being in Taijiman in an environment where it's so positive and encouraging has helped me overcome some of the things that I had to face on my own by myself. And so I benefit greatly from Taijiman, and many of us have. And right now, we'd like to welcome one of the Taijiman Jitsu, Brenda, to share her personal experience and what she and her family went through because of the case in his present. Hi everyone, my name is Brenda Chen. To stay away from the nightmare caused by prosecutors for Pyron, I have moved to the United States for almost 18 years. On Christmas Eve in 1996, there was no peace in my family. Even though no one accused my dad of any crime, he was detained and not allowed to communicate with others for four months by the prosecutor. Our house was searched. We were scared and didn't know when my dad would come home. By means of hunger, threat, and fatigue, the prosecutor just wanted my dad to testify against my shameful it threatened that my mom would be sent to, and then nobody would take care of my sister and me. He was trying to first force my dad to make false testimony. My dad listened to his conscience and told the truth. The prosecutor was very angry and extended my dad's detention by two months without any justified reason. While my dad was being detained, my dad's brothers, but my mom. My sister even received a written note at school. Before retirement, my dad was the chief financial officer of a famous company with outstanding credit. However, because of prosecutors' illegal investigation, his credit was totally ruined. Two or three days after my dad was released on bail, the bank which drew our mortgage. It was impossible for my parents to make ends meet only on my mom's salary. My, mom, my dad had to ask our relatives for help. However, because of negative news reporting about high demand, they were not willing to help us and even left at my dad. Afterwards, because of negative and false press reports, my mom, who worked in the Ministry of Justice, was under a lot of pressure and was forced to retire early. My sister and I went abroad to live a heartbreaking place. She went to France and I came to the United States. Years later, my dad received national compensation for unlawful imprisonment. But nothing could ever compensate for our pain and suffering from this incident. Seven years ago, my dad passed away with regret. I'm able to see them, the redress of a Taijiman case. We sincerely hope that by speaking out, international friends will better understand the case. I remind the Taiwan government to hold the legal officials accountable. The unlawful government officials should admit their mistakes, start damaging Taiwan's democracy, and return the confiscated land of Taijiman. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, for once again joining us and sharing your experience. I know every time she speaks, it's a reminder of what had happened. Um, it hurts once again, and we truly hope that this could and for you know, once and for all, and that we could all live on and move on, um, and hopefully help others who also suffer, who unfortunately have to suffer. Uh, but I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you that uh, we have collected many of these stories, whether it's Taijiman case or other unjust cases in Taiwan, in the book 
that we have launched today and also with the bags that are free for all of our participants from you to take a look to flip through um, many great stories and experiences in here for you to uh, refer to um, to look at and also in the bags will be our flyers with the QR codes and then also reference to public hearings by uh, presented by Professor Jacobson here and so all of this for uh, your reference for you to utilize Speaking about the book, um, so I, I joined Titan when I, was, when I was nine, when I was very shy, that's what I mentioned, and a few months later, this is what happened. And I remember um, seeing everyone who was taken away to the police station, everyone who was arrested, who did something wrong, they would all wear like a helmet, head down, as they were taken away. But I remember that year, at the end of the year, Dr. Hong was illegally taken. And I saw on the news, my Shifu, who had, I've only known for a couple months, he didn't wear a helmet. He was able to face the public with a slight smile, knowing that he did nothing wrong. I was only eight, almost nine at the time, but I knew from the fact that he was not ashamed, he was not trying to hide, that he did not do anything wrong. And all of these years, all the evidence, all the truth that we've found, we know that he has done nothing wrong. In this book, talks about the times um, when he was in jail. The duvet he had was moldy, it was old. And Taitman Dietz and some of our brothers and sisters wanted to send in new ones for our shifu to use. Did he get them? He ended up having these wounds that started to rot. And if it was next step, he would have had to have an amputation. I did not know the story until this book was written. Because all of these years that with the persecution going on, Dr. Hong, my shifu, our shifu wanted us to continue to love, continue to look at the bright side of things, continue to cultivate ourselves to become better people in our lives. That's why I did not know about that story until I guess last year when it was starting to be written um, and to be published. So I, we all hope to continue the love that we felt from Dr. Hong from Tai Chi Men, to send that to you, to share that love with you, um, to wish you all the best as well. And so I'd like to invite our young brothers and sisters from Tai Chi Men to share with you the song, Love. And as we go forward from here, that we will have our chin up, we will continue to seek justice for ourselves and all people around the world. And here is love. Sleeping. Sleeping white.
to the same because it's for us as a loving family and we hope to see an end to this so we can continue to be the loving family and also want to invite someone very loving right now dr massimo uh, i think he's trying to connect with us online let's see if it's hi dr massimo we're going to test out the sound a little bit um so we can hear you a little bit better. Can we try again? Can we hear? Let's see if we can hear you. Hello, Dr. Massimo. I see you very well. Ah, there we go. We can hear you now. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, Dr. Massimo, we are coming to. Um, the end, would you like to say something? And maybe someone has a question, you're also welcome um, to raise your hand. We can go through um, some of the questions you have. Yeah, as I said in the video, I would very much like to participate in this event. I attended all the previous ministerials with Ambassador Brown, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 situation still prevents Europeans from uh, coming to the United States. But uh, I follow this wonderful event, uh, and I believe it can be summarized in two sentences. Yes, we, we love Taiwan, we admire uh, Taiwanese uh, culture, and we recognize how happier people who live in Taiwan rather than in some non-democratic country, but say not just because we love Taiwan, we hope they can solve the Taijiman case, which would be very good and very useful for Taiwan's internal harmony and international reputation. Thank you, Dr. Massimo. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? We do have a lot of information, perhaps no questions for now, which I think will be okay. Um, we do have our contact information on all of our um, business cards and you can grab if you want to learn more, if you want to connect any words or maybe we can chat up later. Yeah, okay, so we are coming close to um, this event and we appreciate all of you for being here it's a start um we're trying to connect better around the world for justice in all sorts and all forms and we would sincerely like to invite all of you who have been with us today maybe join us on um in the front we can snap a picture for um, the summit to also utilize as well so well, yes oh. can, you hear, can you hear me uh did you want to come up maybe that'll be better Dr. Massimo, we have a comment. Dr. Massimo, you and I have been on panels together. It's Ken Jacobson from Temple University in Philadelphia. Hello, Ken. Nice meeting you again. It's good to see you. I just wanted to end by saying I've, I've said this before. I have a sign in my office 
that all of my students, my law students see. And it says, it's never too late to do the right thing. And I think that has particular applicability to the Taijiman tax case. Anyway, goodbye, my friend. Ciao. Uh, I will see you next time. I'm hopefully, I'll, next time I'm in, in Italy. I teach in Rome uh, once COVID is over uh, uh, through Temple University. But good work, and it's good seeing you as usual. Yes, I think so. With that smile at the end, and yes, it's never too late to do the right thing. Thank you for that closing comment. Thank you, Dr. Massimo. Once again, welcome all of you to join us. We document this very important moment. Thank you. And so we'll turn the camera. Carol will take the pictures in the back, and then everyone can join us. Thank you for being